Hello world, I'm Daria Zhuk, co-founder at Dobra Venture Studio. Welcome to Dobra Talks, the podcast delving into the intricate world of venture building. In our previous episodes, we explored the landscape of venture studios as an asset class, featuring insights from industry leaders such as Morrow, Studio Hub, Mamadan, Uniborn, Zurich Institute of Technology, and many more. If you haven't caught up on these conversations yet, I highly recommend you do it, as we have had the crema de la crema of the venture studio world sharing their perspectives. Today, we talk about tech for good, and our focus is on impact startups, companies that create game-changing tech solutions with a positive societal change or environmental impact. This subject holds particular significance for us at Dobra, as we are passionate not only about venture building, but also about extraordinary impact. So let's discuss industry trends and the cutting edge insights on how to build a profit and impact business. And I am really very thrilled to introduce my guest speakers for this episode, each bringing diverse approaches to impact startup development and collectively boosting significant achievements in this challenging and trendy domain. Sasha Lipman founder of Tech to Impact, a global digital hub for impact tech, uniting 800 plus founders, mentors, investors, and corporate partners passionate about using technology and science to address pressing issues of our world. Anne Decker, managing director at Wards, Berlin-based venture builder, known for its alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, mainly focuses on climate, and boasting an impressive portfolio of three successful exits. Michael Boschmans, serial social entrepreneur, the founder and CEO of Quest, an international impact design studio combining strategy consulting and creative design to drive positive change. Amongst others, Quest helps organizations transition towards becoming a B Corp. So to warm up and get to know each other better, uh, I've got a rather personal question to all of you. So why impact? Uh, how did you get into this purpose-driven tech world? And what is your mission here? So please uh, share your personal stories with us. Cool. Thanks uh, first for, for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure and also to talk to, to you about impact. Um, I think for me personally, impact started uh, already years ago and it's like kind of my DNA. Um, my first job was already in a startup where we focused on um, social impact and um, so we bought a coffee from a growers smallholder farmers in emerging markets and brought that in an online business to private customers um, I think this was the starting point for me when I thought um, what impact can mean for businesses but also the impact it could have more in that time on development markets uh, later then I was uh, with a venture capitalist um, and uh, also in consulting where I realized what kind of um, impact technology can have. Um, so uh, using emerging uh, technologies in different markets and for different model business models really make made a difference and um, could cause a lot of impact um, on um, on people, on society, on the environment. Um, and this is why I started to look more into why shouldn't or yeah, why shouldn't every business have impact on very different dimensions. Um, and this is where where it all started for me, um, the development journey of maybe my professional career, but also where we at Wadix uh, are now focusing or in the last years we're focusing more and more on um, impact venturing. So for me, it's a, a little bit different journey that brought me here. Um, I used to be in very active part during my student times in an organization called ISEC, uh, which is all about impact, making the world a better place, young people. Um, all of those things together, um, which uh, gave me a very strong impact bone inside me. And afterwards, I landed in a more professional career also in the startup scene, very by accident. And mm -hmm. similar to Anne, where I was connected to venture capital, to accelerator business, and fell in love with technology and what it can do, and was quite frustrated that a majority back then, let's make a clarification, it was a while ago, luckily now it's not the case, of all tech startups and all the topics has nothing to do with impact. And of course, there was a huge stigma back then around the, the concept of impact being all about nonprofits and being all about this hippie movements and things like that, uh, which something that for me was a big dissonance inside my 
my mind and my my heart <laughs> that why one one other thing excludes the another one. So therefore, that's actually how the tech to impact was born is to really focus on businesses that have a core problem that they're solving, which I call personally relevant problem that they're solving with use of technology. And um, this is how it got to this particular field for me. Okay. And then uh, for me, it also was a completely different angle. I, I um, worked at a marketing agency for five years, a long time ago already. And I was a marketing manager, account manager. And all of a sudden, I also became responsible for sustainability reports and actually writing them. So I felt like, okay, I'm doing something well, I'm doing something good for our planet. But eventually, it, it actually turned out to be a lot of greenwashing. So I said, I'm going to stop this. <laughs> uh, I think that rings a bell for a lot of people in the impact scene. Uh, I became a freelancer. And then I bumped into a guy who was running a clean tech startup um, focused on off-grid water purification. Um, really smart, uh, really good solution, really good solution for our planet. So I started working with him as a CMO of the company. Um, and there I realized that you have a lot of people with amazing skills and they want to apply those skills to make our planet better, to build companies. But those companies remain too small because they don't think about go to market or product market fit uh, soon enough. And they... They focus on building feature after feature after feature because that's about what they feel what they feel comfortable at. But at the same time, you need to think about how am I, how am I going to sell this? And that's actually how I started Quest um, because I saw a very clear gap there, and I wanted to make sure that all those amazing solutions also end up being big solutions for our planet and don't remain small the entire time uh, because that's a big issue for the industry still, I think. What a different process, but yeah, we're all here. <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, so let's start with the impact valuation. And let's first uh, define what the social impact is. Uh, for example, I will share how we um, define this. Uh, when we build a venture in our uh, venture studio, so we start with the ideation. And before launching the batch of the startups, uh, we use um, a data-driven approach to data sourcing analysis and basically generating the insights. And that include, you know, many, many data sets, uh, structured and unstructured, patents, science research, companies, social media, so many, many different big data. And at the end um, uh, of this big data research, we came to like we identified for ourselves like three uh, major domain, social domain where we would like to operate. Uh, and we just, you know, separate them like environment uh, and climate, then uh, health and longevity, and then like future lifestyle. And then we just pick up one sub-issue, mental health and well-being, and we just launch our track. So this is our approach. This is how we evaluate the impact from the very, very beginning at the ideation. So what what uh, what criteria do you use to select the impact startups for instance for your uh, platform sasha uh, maybe let's start with you sure happy mm -hmm. to um that's my favorite question what is actually impact yeah, um, yeah. because it's a uh, fun fact is that i'm originally from ukraine and impact is such a concept word in english and when you try to translate it in your own language without background story it doesn't make sense uh, so you try to say positive impact and then you know everything comes together and people usually ask like what do you mean by impact tag uh, which is a very solid and valuable question because there is lots of frameworks you can use to define impact to measure it and to evaluate it and I also do believe that we overdid it <laughs> and some frameworks are way too complex for everyone to understand each other um, and I do believe you need them for Things like Michael Manchel was reporting and to avoid greenwashing. Of course, you need more detailed KPIs. Uh, but the one thing that we used on and something which, to be honest, we might redo it, uh, we used language that everyone understands, which is sustainable development goals, um, which is the framework that at least, you know, on a very top level, people can relate to. Um, and then in our evaluation criteria, we do ask them to specify the targets that they're addressing and if they actually measure impact. 
So in this case, I also can tell you, putting my, my hand on heart, is that a lot of fantastic impact-driven businesses are not tracking their impact, not, not because they're you know bad actors or something, but it's in business world, it's not the practice. So unless you're coming from an NGO or turning into business or something where you know how to do it, then you will do it. For every impact tech business, which is business, um, is also a lot of questions if, when, how, to do it and then they look into all these big frameworks and you know they give up because it's too much and they want to focus on actually changing the world so mm-hmm. that's why we said uh, let's not over complicate it and we usually dive into each startup and we see if they really mean it because you know some startups pick 17 out of 17 that they address them all and i'm like okay that's not how it works uh, so then we analyze the targets and if they even make sense and then if they just chose them for the sake of choosing we really look into business. And for us, the most important thing is that it's a proactive impact, meaning that it's not that we run the marketing platform and we employ disabled people, which is amazing. But for us, this is rather a social enterprise or social responsible business versus impact tech. Um, so in this case, we usually look into answering one question is the problem that they're trying to address with technology is really the one that creates an impact and an output. And if it's a yes, um, it doesn't matter if it fits SDG framework or not, we will accept them. Because if I'm being completely honest, SDGs are great, but they are outdated, Mm -hmm. way outdated to the current reality. Yeah, true. Hmm. Thank you. So, Anne, how do you assess, uh, especially environmental impact? As I understand, you now more focus on on, on environmental impact. Uh, issues. I'd say it's it's part of our business, and I'm with Sasha, and I experienced also the same over the last years um, of working in that scene. Um, and I would have like two answers for you. Um, one is like how to ex- assess it from, let's say, an investor perspective uh, when we collaborate with startups. And there you can, for example, say for every invested euro, you can measure like how much impact you have on social criteria or environment environmental criteria. And this is also what I see in the in the scene if it's like the best measurement of all i don't know but it's easy and you can really see um what kind of impact and not only like outcomes but real impact you can have on society or environmental goals um you set up before mm-hmm. so this is like like something from an investment perspective when we look from the venture building perspective um we start i think quite similar as you do. So um, we take into account our model of uh, measuring like um, in the validation, but we have an idea, we validate it, and we look at the um, feasibility, viability, and um, we look into, so first of all, business models, for example. We look into business model, what kind of business model is it? Is it like an impact-driven business model? Uh, what kind of impact does it have? This is why, like one thing when we evaluate business models. Then the second thing is we look on the tech infrastructure, um, and this especially in the feasibility space. So, for example, what kind of tech infrastructure do you have, and what kind of impact does it create? If you um, you can have a look at coding, for example, and we also develop like different. Uh, frameworks about how to have minimal impact um, by a different kind of code. This could also have an impact already on the environment. Mm. And the third third thing is also how you um, bring in like efficiency and um, opportunity driven collaboration, for example, um, into your business model, into setting up this venture. Um, is it like how how different kind of money you put into the venture uh, from what kind of investors? Is it on um, how do you develop your team and how uh, do you spend money or how, where do you spend money for? And this is something um, you can also have an eye on. So um, when we develop a venture, it's not only about like it must be like an impact driven business model, but everything um, that needs to build the basis um is it like tech is it like team is it like investment um and this is where we thoroughly uh look into when we build something new mm. cool. and it was feasibility viability and desirability um of course the uh-huh. third the, the three three ones of the validation space and then um and i think most of the venture builders have that we have a fourth criteria where we look into impact um, and this is then where we assess all of the three uh, more on the impact driven triple bottom line, um, economic, environmental and social criteria. So, Michael, um, the floor is yours. Uh, 
maybe some, some insights on this. And also I'm quite interested in, in your B Corp certification processes. And I understand you also have like a special assessment, uh, I don't know, technology or tool when you assess uh, startups values, whether they aligned with, with these B Corps criteria or, so please tell us. Well, first of all, I really like that Anna calls out the the potential impact of coding on the environment because we happen to be quite good at that and also for Shasha to call out SDG bingo because I also recognize that <laughs> um, and um, well but first of all the way we evaluate companies you work with because we, we we tend to be quite strict on who we who we help and who we work for it's we we, we purely focus on what is the problem they are trying to solve um, and and are they solving an actual problem? A lot of companies aren't aren't solving an actual problem. They're trying to solve. They're trying to market a product that doesn't really solve an actual problem. And then we also find, then we also look for, of course, do they have a solution that makes our life or our planet better? And then within that space, if we do, they focus on sustainability as a whole, or do they purely focus on one aspect and then really zoom in on that aspect, but they ignore everything else because that's what we see a lot, especially uh, let's say for instance, um, sustainable merch. We're really looking into sustainable merch for a project funded by the European Union, Radio Green Tax. Uh, if you look at sustainable merchandising right now, it's really focused on using recycled content, but the percentage of a recycled content can be quite limited. So how sustainable is sustainable merch at this point? If you, if you look into, into the entire supply chain, for instance, mm. um, so, and what if, what if a company has a really sustainable product, but it's manufactured by people in the South who have, we don't actually earn a living wage. And we are looking into all of those aspects. There are plenty of frameworks out there. A lot of companies, well, most companies get lost with all the frameworks like GRI, SASB, GRESB, now, now CSRD. Um, everyone's getting lost. And what we actually did is we made our own sort of impact scan. You can download it for free on our website. But it's a, a sort of mixture of all of those, uh, like also including B Corp. That's one of the biggest uh, assessments because I think it's all one of the most encompassing ones. Um, um, and it's a mixture of all of those because if, if we are honest and we look into all of those frameworks separately, they all ask for the same deal. They just mm -hmm. have a little bit of, a, a little bit different nuances. And we tried to simplify things by making it extremely visual. So we created a sort of impact scan tool where we analyze governance, um, employees, suppliers, communities, environment, all the impact that the company has on all of those aspects. And then we visualize it so we, we can also benchmark it and with their competitors. Because what we notice is we can actually, vis if you visualize an impact versus giving them a 40-page report, it has way a way bigger impact, especially if you compare what they are doing versus what their competitors are doing. And then we can, we can start learning from each other. And we see that the impact of that is way bigger than just delivering another report where we just check the boxes of CSRD or whatever framework is necessary. And I think, uh, Michael, this is like a really good one. Uh, when I worked with the Impact Fund uh, before my, my current job, we also did that. And um, for all the different impact entrepreneurs, that was so helpful. And you could really discuss in detail like where others are better and why and really found uh, profound um, tips and tricks how to do it and how to get better in one or the other dimension. I think um, this is really a nice framework you're using. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And sorry, you also asked a question yeah. on B Corp, which I forgot to answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So B Corp is, I think, for us, it's. I know that there's some debate, debate on B Corp due to some companies becoming a B Corp, but at the same time, for us, it's still one of the most all encompassing frameworks to fill in it's um especially for impact startups i've been there i was an impact startup myself um it's it can be quite challenging to fill in the entire questionnaire because you think you're doing well you're you are running an impact startup um but at the same time you haven't noted everything down you haven't formalized all those things and that's what b corp is really good at in helping you formalize all of the procedures that are in your head um and and also just making you think about all aspects of sustainability literally all aspects there are some things that they do forget of course one of they they have to make the questionnaire really scalable so there are a lot of questions in there it's still quite american although that will be changing i think pretty soon um 
but still you learn so much just by filling it in and and don't let that certification be the end goal i mean it's just the journey of getting to that certification and then actually having that certification is one of the first steps and then you move on to improving i'd say but it's more for mature startups as i understand it's far from seed it's more like already gross uh, stage or it can be in early stages it can be early stages as well oh. i think i think oh. the earlier you do it the easier it will be oh, to get okay. the certification um, and also because it just helps like i said it helps you formalize things okay. Whereas I had so many things inside my head, rules and, and and things, okay, I'm doing this well, but I haven't written it down. So who knows about this? How do my employees know what they can do? How do my employees know which uh, benefits they get if mm -hmm. I haven't written it down? So that's where B Corp really comes in handy. At the same time, it also helps you think about all aspects. I mean, you, you, you can mean very well, but they really guide you on, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And then of course, they also... They don't, yeah, they challenge you and they check, they check up on your answers, which not all frameworks do that thoroughly, I'd say. And I think this is also why it's so worth to really start it quite early on um, as it gives you structure and if it's as it asks the right questions that you maybe never thought about when developing your log logistics or purchase inf infrastructures or whatsoever. There are many things uh, inside. I think some of them maybe you don't have in the very beginning, but they definitely help your structure. Um, I really like B Corp um, as well. We did that. Oh, we did the certification also with the venture I was working uh, with like 10 years ago already. And in Germany, there were only at that time like four or five Beep Corps. So it, it really started. And I have the feeling that it um, grew over the last years um, really nicely because uh, first time we, we had it in the US and there were like, a lot of B Corps and everyone was B, B Corps certified. Um, and I really uh, appreciate to see that it's coming to Europe much more um, and that we have kind of a standard, but also a platform help forum to to really support um, impact ventures to grow. Well, thank you. Um, so let's talk about impact startup development. And here I would like to discuss maybe, you know, general idea. If there's much difference between uh, impact develop, uh, startup development and impact startup development. Because it's always a question like impact versus profit. Uh, even though the recent data, a lot of recent data show that uh, customers are more loyal to impact-driven brands, meaning that impact-driven companies, they create a stronger emotional connection with the customers. And then obviously that impact generates profit, impact generates customer engagement, impact generates loyalty. But this is the question how to balance the social impact and profit uh, in order to build a sustainable business model. So then maybe let's let's discuss from these different angles, like does the growth strategy, for instance, for impact startup differ from just a regular startup, I would say regular startup, like some ideas on that, guys, from you first. I think the question itself is something that needs to be challenged. It's not one versus another and i think this is where everyone is mistaking that you have to choose one of those um well, how we are defining when we say impact we always always saying what's the difference between impact startup versus let's call them regular startup is in the problem you're choosing to solve this is the core difference it's not about whether you will be profitable or not if you want a business to succeed you have to aim to be profitable <laughs> otherwise what are you doing so you're not building a business and don't call it a business. Um, but the difference for like traditional versus impact is first of all in the problem that you're solving. What's the initial thing? What is the what is something that itches you inside that you want to solve? And is this problem really something that has a positive output on environment or or society? Or what is the problem, right? You can say that you're impact driven and your business is not. It's fine. I mean, it's completely fine if you want to make sure that you're running a marketing platform and you still want to be social responsible or create impact with it and you can find ways to do it. But the differentiation isn't the problem you're solving. And to answer your second question, is the path different? 
Yes, in some ways. Um, yes, in some ways, because not all uh, all methods are will work. Meaning, ethics comes in handy, um, and a lot of things, a lot of decisions that you're making with money sometimes can be ethically challenging. Um, and in terms of business models you're picking, especially when you're solving a problem, and moreover, I think the usual pitfall is whether your customer is capable to pay to solve this problem. Um, so this is where it gets tricky in terms of finding the right business model. But don't get me wrong here in terms of not having business model at all. So if it's uh, someone claiming that it's an impact startup and the impact business and they don't have a business model, it's not a business, it's a project. Um, so which is something that I will always say to people who are saying, oh, but if you choose impact, you mean there is no money. I'm like, then no, it's not about choosing impact. It's about whether you're building business or not. And that's a totally different bulk story. And the journey is different because it's not always easy to balance impact and revenue generation. So how do you keep both in check and ensure that you don't have a mission drift by any chance? So this is where the the selection of the right business model and, and available customer persona is what matters. Uh, but it's the same question for any business, right? The only differentiation is whether your customer segment that you really want to help to is the one who is going to pay or not. And then this is where you start finding alternative business models and who can cover that cost. And this is where a lot of social enterprises are born. Um, but to answer shortly, it's not one versus another. It's do you run a business or not? <laughs> That's the simplest question. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Thank you. And please, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Zafa, and this is also how we see it. Uh, we wouldn't build any business which can't be profitable in the end. Um, so I, I can just quote what you said. Uh, maybe in addition, um, how we see um, so impact businesses growing, I think we see most of them really tackling big problems. Um, so the question is, um, what kind of smaller or bigger problems are, are they really up for and most of them choose the bigger ones which really have an impact and, and make a change and for that we need different for example investment logics um, so what we try to do is also in the very beginning to try to support them with public funding for example um, with a more co-creative approaches so bring them in contact with different businesses, for example, who are in the markets uh, that they target or who are um, have similar problems maybe or can impact these problems with their products. So for us in the in the early stages, it's really like looping in, looping out always to find really the business uh, model and um, to to support them with the right financing and the right contacts um, to, to make that happen. Um, so the let's say the horizons um, when they grow um, are maybe a bit different from typical other startups that we would see um, in some of our, for example, AI-driven venture building or manufacturing-driven venture building in, in German Mittelstand. It's quite different from, uh, from when we work with uh, impact ventures. Um, so it, it needs a bit different mechanics and maybe a dip, bit more trust and depth um, of, of breeze uh, in terms of investment. Um, but all the other things I would definitely say uh, or stay with Sasha. Yeah, and, and speaking about your exits um, and what, uh, I, I know maybe you are under NDA, but just maybe some general, you know, insights uh, like, what lessons did you learn from that? At what stages uh, did you exit? I mean, some difference from, from regular startups or, again, as you said, the combination of funding like public and private. So maybe some insights here. Um, so to be honest, I think it's not black and white. But mm -hmm. uh, in average, I would say um, that the investment horizons are a bit longer. Um, so you need more breath as an investor. And the other thing is um, it's uh, it can be much more risky. Um, so normally also the impact investors, uh, which we work with or we were, we invest in, we know that uh, the impact ventures 
can be a bit more risky depending on what kind of business model of course they have and what kind of market they are working um for which kind of user group they are developing a product so uh, for example when we look into the energy market and we now look into clean tech um and we know that there might be new hardware coming for uh, CO2 capturing or decarbonization or whatever it can be, it will be something different than maybe building a machinery for a product you already know or changing some, something in a system and building a new digital product. So it needs much more time. Um, but this is goes really for our industry or the ventures we are working with um, as we are focusing on manufacturing AI and sustainability, we know that normally all these different ventures and the technology behind, um, especially the hardware development, needs more time and it, it's quite risky. Um, but the impact it can have in the end is also uh, great. And especially also in, in Germany or Europe, we see a lot of investors, but also startups going into that direction uh, to start developing more into the hardware again, uh, which I think is a really nice development. Thank you. Michael, uh, question to you um, as to the impact strategist first. Uh, what new challenges and opportunities do you see for impact startup now uh, in this post-pandemic period, in these um, economic crisis in this turbulent geopolitical situation and what strategies uh, basically startup use to you know to 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 be sustainable now so do you see any difference uh, from i don't know from last 3 5 years in this impact driven uh, strategies first of all i think it, it it hasn't become easier of course i think i i think it's good that we have companies organizations like the ones of anna and sasha because right now it's it's way harder to get funding uh, i see a lot of impact startups struggling right now i also see how uh there's also still a, sometimes i think it's way harder for impact startups although there's a big focus on it but i still think it's harder for impact startups to raise funds because there's still a very big mismatch between what investors are looking for or or what they expect and then what uh, an impact startup expects from an investor. Uh, and the way they communicate is very much, there's a lot of mis mismatch going on there. I still have discussions with banks who say we have so many entrepreneurs applying for a loan and they're focused on circular economy and we don't have a clue on how to how to evaluate a company working in circular economy. Um, so that's a big issue. Uh, then at the same time, what I also see is, uh, especially with impact startups, is perfectionism slows down what they are doing. They really, they're going to try and solve all of the world crisis at once, but that, that's not going to happen. But at the same, that's really slowing them down at some point as well. Uh, and then when it, when it comes to opportunities, I think there are always plenty. There are a lot of a lot of problems to tackle. So there are also, also a lot of opportunities for impact startups. Where I see the biggest changes happening right now is the switch from carbon to biodiversity. I think that we're going to see some big changes happening there. There are a lot of biodiversity startups emerging. Uh, it, will, it will be really good to see that space. Uh, it will also be really good to monitor that space because I also think why a lot of corporates are making the switch is because it allows for easier greenwashing because it's such a complex topic. <laughs> and, 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 and CO2, I mean, has, has gotten a lot of, or CO2 neutral, neutrality has gotten a lot of negative feedback. So that's why I see a, a major shift towards biodiversity. I mean, I go to a lot of impact events. I see a lot of people talking about the biodiversity. At the same time, I haven't seen any proper biodiversity strategy yet. I haven't seen anyone really talk about what biodiversity really is about. But there are some really interesting startups emerging in that space, I think. I think it's very valuable and very, very fresh. <laughs> so, Sasha, then maybe your experience in building the your platform, your hub, is now is, is very interesting for us as michael said so this mismatch between you know startups and investors so and you have like the bunch of investors then corps and the founder startups so how do you build this network how do you select the members how do you put them together and how do you find these points for collaboration um to build the success stories it's not easy <laughs> that's one <laughs> thing i can tell you 
it's not easy and to be honest uh it all boils down to people relations as much as you can architect it and follow criteria and industries and everything in the end of the day one big learning for us was that we are a middle person and we don't have the end influence on decision which means we will do our best to put people together but in the end whether the company will invest or not it uh, depends on way more factors than their investment series so this is something which um, I don't know who can crack. If someone will, please let me know, write me a message. Uh, because as much as you can, like how we do it, like we have a strict understanding of what our investors are investing in. Region, criteria of stage, investment tickets, type of technology, whatever other criteria, it's all thrown in the mix. And we have a, an automation tool that evaluates both startups and investors by these criteria and suggests as a match. And we proceed with them. <laughs> of course, there are some details that you cannot write in specification, um, but those are the ones we're going with. And I'm not going to share with you in detail the boring numbers behind all of it, but the conversion rate or percentage of successful deal is very low still. And it's already, keep in mind, we already pre-filtered. So we, we already filter the startups we're working with. We filter investors who say they have interest in this. So it's already filtered even more. Um, and the one thing we learned, if you're looking precisely on the startup investment case, is that it is, in the end of the day, about people. So you cannot evaluate team as much as you want unless people meet each other and see the team. There is no way you can evaluate this. You cannot also prepare startups to the fullest to be ready for investment, meaning that for some investors, they will say, yeah, it's enough for us to go for it. Some will say they're not investment ready. So there are so many more nuanced variables that we cannot predict as a matchmaker, let's call it this way. I, I sometimes jokingly say we are Indian mama matchmaking, but yeah. as much as you know, in the end of the day, unless they two meet and there is a vibe, there is no investment. Yeah. As much as funny as it sounds, it's true. And you cannot predict those things. So what is our role and where we see ourselves thriving is initially seeing this potential, at least by criteria, and on the startup side, really doing our best to um, help them get there, meaning through mentoring programs we are hosting, or we used to do accelerator programs, giving them knowledge, giving them education. But in the end of the day, it's again on startup to decide whether they want to fine tune themselves, get better, improve themselves or not. So this is where from investor side, we actually even analyze, we were very curious, what is the problem? Because you know there's investment gap and a lot. And we say, okay, we have investors who want to invest in impact, so they should not be a problem. And what is the problem? Why there is such a smaller percent of success deals out of these matches? And what we realized is that we actually dropped them down in three categories. So we have a question for investors in terms of their impact investing. And they say, actively doing it, exploring with you guys um, and seeing or my portfolio is mixed. And I was actually... Curious, I was, I was sure that the, the issue is that we have a lot of the ones who are mixed or exploring. And funnily enough, the ones who are exploring and mixed are more responsive and less critical to a certain stage because they're exploring it. But the ones who are impact driven, they are hardcore. <laughs> they're yeah. like from the very beginning, if it doesn't fit X, Y, Z boxes, this amount of criteria, we're not going to invest which I think is great, but also I feel like some investors are way too critical too early. And this is something where also then startup needs to fit all of those thesis criteria, and then all these investment metrics, which that's why coming back to what I said originally, we have too many of them and they're way too complex. And therefore, it's finally enough, it's not because they don't want to invest in impact, it's they don't know how to handle it. Um, and another big learning that I have, and I still question whether venture capital is the model to fit impact startups, because the return that is expected and, you know, it, uh, to me, VCs are great, but this is to me are, if I'm talking about human growth, if it will be like teenager entering 20s, it's like, it's, as far as the hype is, I'm there. I can do it. I already have some capital. There is a hype. I'm in. So luckily, climate topic is a hype now. Amazing, fantastic, very happy. But then you cannot expect the same return, the same mechanism, the same hyper growth if you want this climate startup to succeed. 
So this is where it clashes. It's like by paper, it all fits. We invest in climate. This is our ticket. This is our technology. It fits. But then when you talk about it and you ask him, why didn't you invest in the end? Oh, there was nuances, things. And then you realize that maybe the mechanism and the return that they're expecting is not there, not the right match. So that's what I can say from our table, <laughs> focusing more on the maybe... Yes, yes, Can I maybe just ask something? Uh, because what I also noticed is because you're talking about the investors um, asking for quite a lot already, being very demanding. What I also see is the other way around. I, I feel like a lot of startups come to us and they say, we really want to grow. We want to grow exponentially. We're going to fundraise. But then when you really ask all the hard questions, you feel that do they really? I, I, I sometimes I doubt it mm. because they don't they don't dare to make the, that next step because they're really afraid of working with an investor that they would have to yeah. evaluate their values. That's uh, also true. Yes, and we see that a lot. Yeah. yeah, it's also the question of Michael in terms of market scarcity right now. And yes, in the last few years, it's more scarce than it was before. Before, if you pitch in US and you have nothing, you can raise a million. Now, even if you are even in US, which is more risk taking and opportunistic when it comes to venture capital, it's not the case. Um, mm -hmm. So, especially the concern I see with impact startup is first of all this you know mission drift fear, which is very legit. I mean, I've seen mm -hmm. startups crack, and we actually have a case in our portfolio where a startup had a very impactful idea, and then because they couldn't find the right business model and already had some investors who were pressuring them they pivoted into something which has no impact anymore, which is fine. It can happen, but, you know, it's also the certain pressure that you're going into. So to answer your question and your observation, you have a point. Absolutely. Startups are also freaking out in a good way and in a bad way at the same time in terms of fundraising, and they have valid reasons. So they either afraid that they are not ready. Mm -hmm. And I think some are, if you're looking psychologically, it's, as if you would be getting a co-founder on board, right? If you build something for so long and then someone yeah. else has a stake in it and they can say it, we jokingly say to them, evaluate or do your due diligence on investors as you would do on your future husband or wife. Because in the end mm -hmm. of the day, you're sharing maybe even more time with them that you would want to. And you need to make sure that there will be no mission drift. And also another big issue that we are trying to prevent startups from having is to know how to play the game. Because there are lots of legal tricks that VCs use. And that's why we are also evaluating and not accepting all VCs in our network. Because there is lots of ways how you can trick the startup into bad conditions, which will pop out afterwards. And because they are on the search and on the lookout and the scarcity is there in terms of their opinion, even though money is there, there is enough capital for everyone. But you know that how it positions and how it goes and there is not enough and the market is going to shit. And based on this, they're freaking out that, oh, someone said yes, that I'm going to be with them. But then they sign without looking. I mean, they all do. But really to understand it, you need to critically assess and not be in the panic state. And some of them write us, we are running out of cash. We don't know what to do. We're going to accept this deal. And we literally had to stop one startup from accepting a deal which will make them sell 40% of their company. I'm like, no, <laughs> don't do this. Like, no, just close the company. Don't do 40% because the conditions were terrible. So this is where I think there are lots of factors playing on the both sides. Yeah. And do you, start, and I would... do you think that steward ownership could help? Because I see a big. I like this and... approach. Yes, I like this approach. But then we are go back to the whether VCs are okay with that, <laughs> which is another question, you know. Because then it's like, oh, what, what is dragalon, tagalon, all these fancy phrases that no one knows. Yeah, it's a cool approach. I like Stuart approach. We actually we have now a co-founder that joined me. Uh, I started it originally myself, but now we're launching in April, and I invited to one of our team members to become a co-founder. And someone was asking, like, what's going to be the percentage? I'm like, well, it's short ownership. It's two of us and 50-50. Like, yes, it might be not comfortable because I put a lot of effort into it originally. But it's the only way that it truly people own it. So that's the question. Yeah. 
And I would add to that, um, we were talking about like startups and how to develop startups and the investment side uh, from a startup perspective. But what we also see on the market is that there are a lot of impact investors, because of course, with the framing of impact, you can gain a lot of LPs. It's interesting. There, There is a market, there are interesting topics. But what does really impact investor mean and what kind of criteria they are looking at from the other side? And this is something for me, which is not very clear because I think the criteria sometimes are quite soft. Um, and what some of the investors say is impact wouldn't be the impact that we were just talking about. Um, because still, um, and this is also why I, I think, Sasha, you're right, is venture capital or what kind of venture capital is the right uh, investment for startups? How Who's helping them to grow and who's going the steps they need to go um, and willing to do that? And I think between like, those two parties between the startups and the investors that must be something developing um, which needs more investigation of time and help and like a mediator to really make that market happy happening um, and I'm let's say not still waiting for that but I think it needs more development um, also on the investor side uh, to really make the market grow. There is a whole wave of alternative capital um, happening on the sites um, and not on the sites in it's happening <laughs> it's happening and there is a wonderful woman Esme who runs the, actually the whole program about alternative capital and it sits again about the bubbles right where the money is like will you find the topic of alternative capital on the big investment summit no would you find it into impact driven impact days that are happening in Coburg in Vienna of course it's everything people are talking about yeah. so it's also the issue of the yeah. If you look on the percentage of the money in the philanthropy, the let's say the old impact mechanism, the old still existing, but the traditional impact financing mechanism, the, there is not even closely enough to achieve sustainable development goals if you're talking about the full scale. So then there is the rise of social entrepreneurship and everything to really get the business going. But then if you look into VC funding, um, it's not even on the path of alternative capital. So alternative capital can be everything from loans, quasi-equity, and a lot of things are there which people are playing around with, but it's not at the scale that we need at least yet. It's yeah, this way. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, so we you know, slowly move to my <laughs> tricky question regarding fundraising. So what is a typical profile of impact investor? As I understand, definitely it's not VCs. I mean, there are VCs playing this impact-driven game, but again, they are not maybe the, the how to say, the, 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 the game changer here. So then if we, if we sum up, what then, who are the impact investors? Like if we give this advice to impact startups, where to go first? Like, I don't know, maybe business angels, maybe some angel syndicates, maybe some uh, non-com uh, organizations, maybe grants. So how do you see this um, uh, fundraising uh, landscape now? I mean, to, to be really effective in fundraising, because fundraising, as you said, this is the most, as I as I know, it, this is the most frustrating <laughs> and <laughs> energy consuming <laughs> processes <laughs> in the startup development. So any, any more ideas uh, or, yeah. Yeah, I, I would add, um, I, I think it can be everyone. It can also be venture capitalists. The question is more about what are their expectations and is it uh, that we need more explanation on or understanding of how uh, impact startups work and how they grow and what kind of support they need. Um, but I think uh, also I can speak for Germany and I would I, I'm currently missing more of the institutionalized uh, investors like pension funds. And so this is something we definitely see. And is it in Switzerland already? Is it in the UK? Is it in, in the US? And in Germany, this happens maybe at some point and, and with some uh, investors, but not at the scale that we need uh, to really make things happen and uh, and grow uh, impact businesses. Uh, so I, I would look on that side and try to convince them to, to come into the market. I would add more on the startup side to balance what Anne said. Um, I think the best fundraising strategy is when you do not need to fundraise, uh, meaning that your business model is actually working, <laughs> that you, what you're creating, what you're building has actually 
business model, <laughs> which is the working one. And it makes sense that you need some capital in the beginning to build and to develop and maybe to do an R&D and to scale. And then hopefully you don't need investment anymore. So it highly depends on which venture you're building. So is it something that is really high risk and very science technology driven that needs lots of R&D and everything, then of course you cannot do it unless you actually developed it. Then I always recommend founders to go with grants, as Anne mentioned already, grants, grants, grants. It's not free money. That's important to be stated. It's not free money. It comes with the price of, of lots of time and lots of servicing of this, but eventually it does not take the equity and you can focus on what you want to do. Um, and then hopefully you don't need investment. Hopefully your business model is the one that is functioning and working. It's not the case for everyone though. It's again, highly depends on your company. So if you're developing a mobile app and you want to raise lots of money, um, my question as an investor would be for what? Mm. So this is where the question is, can your business model function eventually itself? Or are you following the typical VC hyper growth case with the big exit in the end? If it's the case, then sure, fundraise. That makes sense that your, your clear strategy is to sell it. But I haven't met many impact startups that want to sell. So this is where I usually say to startup, if you're pumping in investors and you're not planning to sell it, get to the point that you will not own it anymore, um, which is something to keep in mind. And it simply depends because my concern with startups who are jumping into fundraising is that they do not see the bigger picture where they're bringing it to. So unless you know what is the end goal of what you're running, don't do fundraising because then your strategy is not clear. You're, you're focusing on surviving versus on building a business, um, mm -hmm. which is something that it, then the mechanism will find itself. Then you pick the fundraising strategy and the right investor based on what you want to build and what do you need and what is the output of what you want to build. That's what I would say. And do you guys see more corporations in this landscape now? Because yeah. you know, this corporate innovation seem again is very trendy yeah and, yeah, yeah. Back. So, so corpse can be uh one of these alternative capital would say or, or no what do you do you think what i what are your feelings it's a middle there is a big mm -hmm. trend of corporate venture building so they built in house which is also great for the plant and for society amazing um there is also a big trend of corporate venture capital uh, investing in startups i see it more and more which is amazing um, corporate startup innovation, so corporate startup collaboration, I hope it's going to be back soon um, mm -hmm. because it's it has been always there, but, you know, the budgets were cut during pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Hopefully. Uh, I was also going to mention, like, don't forget about corporates. Uh, a big um, example that I can give there for startup corporate collaboration is Fashion for Good. We're very active in the sustainable fashion sphere. And Fashion for Good is an, um, I would say it's an innovation platform. They have their own museum in in, um, in Amsterdam focused on sustainable fashion. But at the same time, what they do is they scout for the best innovations in, 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 in sustainability in fashion globally. Uh, and then they put them through an accelerator program. I'm also mentoring that program. It's really, it's really, really good. And then they also connect them with funding, but also with big corporates. So they can do pilots with, for for instance, Adidas or H&M Group. Um, and that is super interesting. It can be dangerous uh, because then maybe H&M Group can decide on who to make or break. But at the same time, it, it also has tons of potential. Yeah, I'm with you, Michael. And I think we're working with a lot of family-owned businesses um, and the the values of these businesses and the um the founders family let's say behind is quite strong and they know how hard it is um to really build a venture how to stay with a venture over um a specific time frame and we see a lot of entrepreneur families um really going into that space and i think this is really good uh, maybe money has to be combined um because uh, also the investment horizon and the investment volume is always not the biggest one um, but I, I would say if they combine knowledge and if they combine access to their own companies, to use cases, to money, um, it would be really um, a nice one and could have a lot of impact, especially in the early stages, to get um, 
uh, good investors. The thing is, um, what I also figured out with some of our startups, if you have an investor from the corporate side, so if you have a, a strategic investor inside, mostly then bigger funds are not very interested in later stages because they always think that the strategic investor has a different kind of impact uh, on the startup. Um, so it's a balance uh, you need to find. And um, I'm, I'm going more for let's find different opportunities, create verticals and uh, together and uh, then invest into, into uh, opportunities. You don't need to do that alone um, and by yourself always. Um, but but do it together, and um, then there is a lot of impact. I, I would say coming from the corporate side as well. Well, good trend, good good trend. So my last but definitely not the least question um, in fundraising: uh, What are your predictions regarding the industries uh, that will be trending? I mean, in social impact uh, from your perspective, are trending now and will be trending? I don't know in two three years perspective where to go to build a sustainable impact startup and where to go for investors to invest in which industries? I think I already mentioned biodiversity. I think there's a lot of money will, will flow into that. Um, a, a lot of research still needs to be done. There are still so many things unclear. Um, and then being a startup there, it's, it will be pioneering, but I think you'll, you will reap the rewards in the long term. Uh, so I think biodiversity... And of course, now, I mean, whenever you're looking for a grant, all they ask for is, will, will you include AI? <laughs> uh, so so I'm, I'm assuming that AI will still be, will still be there for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, so my, the thing that I see is biodiversity, uh, biodiversity, AI, and then traceability, and maybe combining all of them. <laughs> uh, but traceability is also a big one in the next years. Mike had just pitched an idea for startups. Throw it all three together, and you have the winner. <laughs> uh, I would go with Michael. Uh, I would definitely say um, it's around biodiversity, or we call it like lean, uh, clean tech. Um, the question is always what you put under it um, and how you frame it. Uh, but but we are definitely going more into that space. And what I also see growing is the education space. Um, I think there was always something inside, um, but I think especially also in more um, developed markets, um, there's still a lot to do in that uh, in that market. And I would say um, we have a great chance to develop it further. So um, I would also look on that one. Next to health, for example, uh, and mobility, um, there are always like tiny bit chances inside but the big ones, uh, will, from my point of view, definitely happen in biodiversity, clean tech. Uh, it's like social too. services. Yeah, if we talk about education, medical care, so it's more like social services and something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sasha? I would say energy transition is a big deal. Um, and, I, and I think it's going to be still a big deal for quite some time as we are trying to cut the gas gas ties, you know, with everything happening in the world and not having oil and gas industry around the world anymore. That would be lovely. <laughs> it would be also better for environment. Um, I also think that um, the AI trend is not going anywhere. Uh, and it's in a good case that it's going to transform every industry. Um, and I see it being more of a growth in terms of health health, biohacking, all of those topics in terms of how can we really use um, the new ways of um, the whole topic of longevity, of extending our lives and you know prolonging that is a big thing that I think is coming. And it's still under radar and I feel like it's going to boom at some point. Um, in terms of in other industries, um, I still think that the whole carbon capturing, as much as it's saturated now, will not go away. So it's very close to what Anne mentioned with clean tech. Um, I think it's something where the maybe not even the carbon capturing, it's the aspect of clean tech plus circularity. So this, you know, whole renewable topics or circularity topics, uh, because we are running out of resources as a planet. I feel that the this thing that I mentioned besides long longevity is connected to this recycling, renewal, how can we reuse things? And that's why I think circular economy is now booming, renewable energy is booming, and hopefully we will find a way to really 
uh, find the, the way to recycle resources that we have on the planet. And what about underrepresented founders, uh, femtech, this kind of, of, of stuff? Or I think maybe it's becoming more like hygiene or we still have this gap and we still have this problem? What do you think? A quality gap is a problem and will be a problem for a real long time. <laughs> um, it, it's it's a people problem. It's not the technology problem. Um, it's the people besides technology that is the problem. And you can see it in the bigger, wonderful innovations that, you know, even beautiful AI can be ruined with chat GPT having wrong data set, which is biased. So it's not about technology. It's about people behind it. So from my side, the gender gap is there um, and Femtech is amazing, but Femtech is also part of the health innovation. Um, so this is not only in terms of, I think, Femtech, it's also about minorities overall and access to, to healthcare. Uh, which now is expanding through various technologies. And maybe one thing to mention here is that blockchain became less popular on the newspapers, but more practically implemented in many solutions. And the whole topic of access and decentralization, decentralized governments and things like that is a big deal now. Okay, go. so let's let's wrap up. So maybe you would like to add something uh, at the end or um, so. Then... Then okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, it was a really pleasure talking to you, meeting you all, and I hope that we're gonna collaborate further. Um, in this impact world, it's a, as I call it, small big world. I mean, <laughs> definitely we're gonna meet and see each other and, and uh, in some project. Yeah, we have in the room full house of, from developing in from early to full investment. So yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> just transition ventures from one player to another. <laughs> Throw them exactly. In. Thanks for joining and we're going to stay in touch. Thanks for inviting Thank us for bringing us together. What a nice talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Nice. Nice Thank all you. Of As we wrap up this insightful conversation with our incredible guests, it's obvious that impact startups play a crucial role in shaping a sustainable future. Their commitment to positive change coupled with the support of eco players, underscores the potential of technology and science to address our world's most pressing issues. To all the aspiring impact entrepreneurs out there, take note of the valuable insights shared today and remember, the journey to creating a better world begins with a single impactful idea. And at the hit song goes, we are the world. And I have one more exciting news for you. It's time to meet in person. Join us at our community event in March. All the details are in the description of this video. This is Daria Zuk signing off from Dober Talks. Until next time, and keep building ventures that matter. <music>